So, uh, Michael Beckerman, I run a company called Cree Tech, C-R-E Tech, out of New York. And for this conference, because it's not my conference, I'm delighted to be here to support Gary and Future Prop Tech. I will refrain from F-bombs, which I'm known for, I promise. I will be respectful. And I'll actually give you the, the, the term Prop Tech. So we will not refer to it as Cree Tech or C-R-E Tech. Uh, which we typically do in the States. Um, but it's a great, great pleasure to be here. So we're doing the same exact thing that Future Prop Tech is doing only in the US. So we're running very large conferences that we started seven, eight years ago. And just like you're experiencing here, when we got started, it was a few, maybe it was, I don't know, 100, 200 people. And now we're doing events in the thousands, which is really exciting. So I'm thrilled to be here to support everything that's happening in Europe and throughout the rest of the world in the prop tech sector. When I got started 2012, there were literally a dozen startups that I knew that I connected with in New York. There was 50 million invested in the space, 2012-ish. Last year, we tracked 10 billion invested globally in this sector. And we also track about 4,000 or so startups. So, the growth has been extraordinary. And you're seeing it here, we're seeing it in the States. And so I'm just you know, really, really thrilled to be here at my first Future Prop Tech event. Clearly, the innovation that's happening on the space every day is, is extraordinary. And the pace of investment is also just unbelievable. And so I'm really fortunate and blessed to have four of the top investors with us for this session from in the US, but also globally, to talk about where they're investing, what trends they're seeing, uh, and where, where, where they think we're going, right? And so it's my pleasure to introduce my extraordinary panelist, Constance from Modern Ventures. Where's Constance? Are you coming? There you are. Justin <laughs> from a little, a little investment company called SoftBank. Roloff from Fifth Wall and Dave from JLL Spark. Take your seats. <laughs> this is unusual, right? We'll have some fun. Um, so let me just uh, shut up and have them just do a quick introduction. Uh, Constance, why don't we start with you, my friend. Sure. Tell everybody who you are and a little bit about Modern Ventures. Sure, hi everyone, my name is Constance Friedman and, um, and Modern Ventures is a venture fund and we focus on technology companies all around real estate, finance, insurance, and home services. Um, we have two parts of our fund. One is the, really three parts. One is the fund itself. We're generally investing in companies that are two to 15 million in revenue. Um, and then we have something that we call the Modern Passport Program, um, which is a way to help our companies come, we call it an industry immersion program. So it's a way to help our companies come into the industry. And, and then on the other side, how we help a network of about 700 or so executives and corporations um, from these industries that are looking to innovate within technology and, and get connected to these, to these startups. So um, we started our first fund in 2008 and um, yeah, seen a lot change over the last decade or so. Great, Roloff? Hi, I'm uh, Rolf Opperman from Fifth Wall. We are the largest venture capital firm focused on what we call the built world of prop tech. Uh, similar to Constance, the kind of unique thing about our platform is that in addition to large uh, institutional investors in our funds, about half to 60% of the fund are large owners and operators of real estate. Um, in London, we have British Land, Seagro, Merlin, and Jacina here in Europe. I co-head the uh, real estate technology investment group. We have about a billion AUM uh, just um, uh, just to finish uh, kind of a, a fun two process. Um, and we're really excited about what's happening in Europe. And I'm going to be spending a lot of time out here as we build out our platform here. Justin? Hi, I'm Justin Wilson, a partner at the SoftBank Vision Fund. Uh, we're a global late stage investor focused in technology uh, companies. And so while we're not focused uh, in real estate in the ways that the rest of the panel is in terms of investments and focus area and the, the nature of the conference, um, we've identified it as a sector that's just tr hugely, um, you know, very large, tremendous opportunity. And given that we're deploying 
billions of dollars, you know, it's hard to ignore real estate. I think it's a category that has tremendous potential, still in the early innings from our perspective. And so we spent a lot of time looking across the, across the industry, residential, commercial, uh, and a lot of different other facets and seeing a lot of interesting trends that we've you know, tracked and uh, we've placed some, some large bets, which I'm sure many of you have read about. Um, and uh, we're a global organization. I'm based out of the California office. We have offices here in London and in Asia uh, and very focused on later stage. You know, our minimum checks $100 million. Um, so that's a fairly late yes, stage. Yes, he said 100 company. million, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a small one. It's it's actually hard to it's hard to and that's it's hard to write a hundred million dollar check. Um, but excited to be here. Thanks for having us, Dave. Uh, thanks very much. My name is David Gerster. I'm an investor with JLL Spark. We are a hundred million dollar uh, prop tech fund. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting about us is our only investor is JLL the corporation. And so that does give us a very strategic flavor uh, when we are making investment decisions. We're always asking, uh, how can we help this startup? How can we actually plug them into the massive, I won't say sprawling, but very large uh, 90,000 person organization that is JLL? Uh, uh, one example of this is uh, in addition to the investment team, uh, we also have a separate team we call the growth team. Their entire job is just uh, figuring out how to plug our portfolio companies into JLL, help them get uh, distribution, uh, and help them grow. And so that's kind of our spiel. Uh, you know, we are very strategically focused. Great, great. So let me ask a question to the audience. So we have a sense of who's in the audience, because uh, it's very different in every country. How many people here are at a startup? Great. And then how many people would you say would be on the sort of the corporate end user side? Interesting. And then maybe on the vendor side, supporting the ecosystem? Good. So a lot of, lot of startups, it's a pretty diverse crowd. Um, so first question, Conscious, I'll give it to you. So as I said, you know, I, I got in this about 2012. It was a very, very small community. We look at today. You know, seven years later, the amount of money that's coming into the ecosystem, the amount of startups in the ecosystem, but also, you know, real estate's 13% of, of global GDP. It's the biggest industry on earth. So, I mean, it's 10 billions a lot when you compare it to fintech, not so much, what have you. Where do you think you, we are in the, in the cycle of prop tech uh, investing and what have you? So I think... Um it's, it's interesting. It, it's, as I said, I've been doing this since 2008. And when we went to go raise our most recent fund, um, you know, about three, three and a half years ago, people were looking at me and kind of patting me on the head saying, what a cute little niche that you're focused on here. And, and I was like, yeah, but it's this multi-trillion dollar niche. And, and, now, um, and now I think it's, you know, it's become legitimized. I mean, a lot of, by the panelists on, on here, um, you know, more and more dollars going in. And, you know, our estimates are even a little bit higher than, than what you say. We think about 14 billion went in this space last year. But I would say it's even actually much higher than that because there's a lot of technology companies that aren't quote unquote prop tech. Um, like, for example, we were early investors in DocuSign. You would never call that a prop tech company, but they had a $4.5 billion IPO last year, and uh, that's not counted in that number. And so, um, so I think a, a lot more than that by those technology companies that touch the industry but aren't necessarily um, sector-focused. And so I think um, where, where are we in the industry? I think it's uh, one of the other panelists on the, on the last um, panel said, you know, come on, people, it's 2019, why, why aren't we using this? But I, I sort of liken real estate right now to the 99, 2000 days when the Fortune 500s were like, oh, this internet thing, it's, it's here now. And I really think that um, in a lot of cases, the real estate operators and owners are saying, oh, this technology thing, I, I guess it's here, we have to figure this out. And so I, I think we're at the beginning stages and that people are just trying to figure this out. Um, I think everybody wants to do this, and there's a lot of different levels of how sophisticated people have, are in terms of actually grasping it and rolling it out. 
I think that there's a lot of disruptors, maybe some of those startups in the room, um, who are trying to say, can we change this model completely? And so I think right now it's up to the traditional real estate owners and operators to figure out how to innovate or get disrupted. Well, uh, I remember meeting uh, co-founders Brad uh, Grywe and, and, and Brendan Wallace, what was it? what year, 2017, 16, they came to New York and met with their team and they're like, we're gonna launch a $200 million fund. And I'm like, yeah, right, whatever. Uh, then like the next day they announced the fund. And then you just did uh, 400 or so million? Uh, yeah, we're, we're, I think we're technically in a quiet period, but yeah, yeah around whatever. that size, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. And, so, yeah. you know, that's, that's a massive amount of money raised and being deployed. Where do you, where does Fifth Wall see uh, the ecosystem right now? Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it at a macro and then I'll maybe micro to Europe because we have a particular amount of focus here as well. Um, so I would say that, uh, you know, totally agree with Constant. I think that, you know, we're really in the early innings um, because what's happening right now is we kind of call it kind of the big bang of real estate tech, which is it's a very confused period. You have real estate people trying to do technology. You have technology people trying to do real estate. The roles are confused. People are trying to figure out what's happening. And it's starting to settle. But I think what you see, certainly in the services industry, you know, JLL, for instance, you know, massive, massive disruption happening at the services level. Because if you're an MIT grad or a Caltech grad or an IIT grad, and you're coming out, you're saying, this is easy to disintermediate. So you start building technology in that area. And now we're starting to see it flow actually into the landlord space where traditionally landlords that felt, okay, own beautiful assets, I'm never gonna get disrupted. Suddenly WeWork comes in and takes your tenant and moves it into their building. And so I think that we're starting to see disruption flow into that end. I really think we're on the tip of the iceberg. Um, obviously I'm conflicted, right? Because you know, it's, 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 it's in my interest to tell you we're at the tip of the iceberg, but I really do believe that. I think specifically in Europe when I was out here fundraising and talking to a lot of strategics, Personally, I feel Europe is probably two to three years behind the U.S. Um, and I say he that he said it, not me. <laughs> and I say that with the with the greatest respect. I actually don't think it's the tech here. I think the tech here is phenomenal. London, particularly, and I think Berlin, two centers of phenomenal tech talent. Um, and you could argue Eastern Europe has some of the best technical talent in the world. Um, I think the bigger thing is that the real estate industry itself is a little conservative here versus the U.S. One, you have a lot more consolidation here than you have in the U.S. In, your, in London, for instance, you basically have four or five entities that control London. Um, in Germany, it's probably three or four. Um, in the US, it's much more fragmented. Uh, so I think that the bigger challenge entrepreneurs have here is they have less people to, to kind of convince in order to get their startup off the ground, uh, which is a, you know, less of, it was an issue in the US, which is why we started Fifth Wall, but less of an issue because you had 40 entities. Um, but I think that the conversations I'm having now, the positive of that, is that the conversations I'm having now are the exact same conversations I had two and a half years ago when I was raising Fund One. Um, the questions are the same. And so I really feel like the success we've seen in the US over the last two to three years, and make no mistake, there's been a ton of change within the US in real estate tech in the last two or three years. I think that's just about to happen in Europe. Um, and in a lot of ways, you're at an advantage here because you can learn the lessons and the mistakes we made in the US. You can learn from that. So that, that's how we think about it in, in terms of that area. That's great. J uh, Justin, I think SoftBank is probably the largest investor venture firm in the world. Um, and I know the, the, the firm does a lot more than, than real estate, obviously. Uh, and, but in real estate, you've made some sizable investments in WeWork, uh, Open Door, Katera, and some others that if you're not familiar with. Um, so when you look at real estate as a sector, you know, what what are you looking at right now that might be interesting or new as opposed to what you've done in the past? Yeah, I, I think the, um, can folks hear me? Yeah. Okay. So let, let me touch on that. But first, I actually, I agree with the notion that we're relatively early in the evolution of the industry and the adoption of technology in the space. I think that the, like, like most industries, you end up with this classic innovator's dilemma. Right, like the incumbents have their entrenched profit pools and how they operate their businesses, and everyone struggles with that migration and adopting new tools, systems, technologies. And, and real estate gets a bad rap because it's, oh, well, those guys are especially slow. 
hell, you don't need to look that far. You look at Microsoft, which continued to sell on-prem and the migration of the cloud while it's much further advanced than it ever was before. Um, took a long time. I mean, this is one of the, the leading technology companies uh, in the 90s and 2000s that was knocked for moving too slowly with emerging technologies. And, and they've caught up and in a lot of ways, I think, are excelling in that category. But this isn't a problem in real estate. This is a problem in every single industry. And so I think we look at this as, as, as a relatively early innings uh, ballgame in terms of the, you know, the 230 trillion of real estate assets, you know, how much property operators are leveraging technology on the commercial side, on the residential side, which I think is a little further along, kind of pulled in from the consumers themselves. Um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity. From SoftBank's perspective, I would say we've struggled with finding the type of growth opportunities on the commercial side that we've found on the residential side. Um, we've tended to see a little more fragmentation, um, kind of lack of full stack solutions and innovators that are solving kind of the magnitude and, and a whole host of problems that a lot of operators are actually experiencing. And so it's, it's, it's hard to find the type of very late stage scaled companies that are actually uh, kind of fall within what, what we tend to look at. When I think about where we're focused on now, I think a little of it's uh, a sign of the times. So we're in a 10 year bull market. Um, and so when we look at opportunities in the space given cyclicality, not just in real estate, but just on a macro basis, technology sector more generally, um, I've tended to be a little more attracted to uh, some of the sub-segments which are going to be a little more resilient through downturns. Uh, so one of the investments that we uh, led here recently is a company called Clutter in the self-storage space in the United States. And, and Fifth Wall is uh, one of the investors in that company. Um, you know, when we look back historically at some of the cycles on residential, I think rentals tend to be a bit more resilient. Uh, Katera is focused on multifamily construction. So, you know, we, are, we do have an eye towards... Companies are going to withstand a softening macroeconomic uh, environment uh, a little more, a little better than the rest of the industry. I think also technology companies that are able to drive meaningful efficiencies and operational scale and leverage also fall within that category. Because I think as you start to get softening with margins compression on businesses, they'll be looking more than ever to find the right types of partners to help them work through those stages. Uh, anybody here from CBRE? No? Okay, good. I'm about to piss you off. So, in my world, in my mind, JLL Spark is at a different level in terms of a brokerage firm, a services firm, and they're investing in prop tech. Um, they're incredibly visible. Their deal flow and their announcements, uh, what they're doing is, 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 you know, they're picking just great, great startups that are really changing the nature of work. Seriously. Uh, Check in, in the mail. At least in my world. So talk a little bit about how does a brokerage firm like JLL Spark approach prop tech? What, it, what might be different now than when, you know, you got started in, the, in, in this space? So it's really interesting. Uh, so uh, the two co-CEOs of Spark were sort of tapped to figure out prop tech, given a mandate by Christian Ulbricht, the CEO. Uh, and when they arrived, and when I arrived shortly after, uh, we didn't even have the fund idea in place. We were just trying to figure out how to help uh, JLL, the corporation, get ahead of you know, all the coming wave of disruption in prop tech. Uh, one thing we have really figured out, having made uh, a bunch of investments, is that it really is important to have that strategic dimension to the investment, right? So uh, me and, and Mahir and Ishai, we all have uh, backgrounds as angel investors, right, where we are obviously uh, exclusively focused uh, or mostly focused on uh, is it a good investment by itself, right? One thing we've really found out, having uh, looked at hundreds of companies, uh, is that the so-called, what we call the JLL fit is very important, right? How do we actually uh, not only find a good investment, but also find uh, a startup that we can actually plug into the global organization of JLL, help them get distribution? I always like to tell the story of uh, Verge Sense. They make a, an occupancy sensor that you, uh, you can mount on the ceiling. It does all the processing on device, so it's not sending like people's uh, faces over the internet or whatever. And it was this tiny little company 
and we invested in them, and now we're sending them, uh, I gather, more business than they can handle, right? And so the flip side of that is it's kind of a pain to have to go to check off this other box, right? Because it gets really detailed really quickly. Like, what actual group are we going to hook this company up with? What are they going to actually do post-financing? Um, you know, to help us out with that, we do have uh, a whole team, as I mentioned, called the growth team, uh, led by a seasoned executive. And all he does all day is, is think about how to solve these very sort of uh, practical questions of uh, what happens post-financing. Um, but yeah, I, it's, uh, it's really exciting to have the resources, obviously, of a, a global uh, commercial real estate firm uh, at your disposal, for sure. Constance, um, so your modern's obviously early stage, right? And we're very thankful about it because a lot of the money is going later stage. What what's got you excited now? What are you looking at now? What's coming? What's applying for passport? What category specifically in the space have you most excited about investing in currently? So um, I guess I'll say a few things. There's there's some areas that I'd say I believe are table stakes right now in that. If you're, as an operator, not focused on this, you're, you're already behind. Um, but, but, but they're very important at this time. It's where there's a lot of growth happening. And then there's maybe a vision of what's coming down the pike a year or two, even three years from now. So I'll start with what I believe is table stakes, and that is, um, I think, like things like AI, and I think that sustainability, you hear a lot about AI, and what does that mean? And we've, when I think about it from a, we're, when we're making our investments similar to what David just said, we're always looking at what business challenge is this solving? You know, so if, if there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are solving a problem, or solving, that have a solution looking for a problem, um, we're always looking at what companies are um, solving real business challenges. And so, you know, for example, we have a company called Bite Gain, which is helping to qualify um, lead gen and qualify people who are coming in. And so you're now spending your advertising dollars on the right leads, not on all the leads. Um, we have a company called Snap that's using AI for identity and fraud prevention. Uh, we're seeing things like AI helping with recruiting, helping with, um, uh, you know, kind of everything across the business so that you're not just stuck with all this data, you're, you're using prescriptive data. And that's, that's what I think AI is really meaningful for. And in particular, if you're not focused on that right now and others are, this is where the machine learning and, and data comes into play because that stuff, um, you know, people, the, the, the technology needs to learn in order for it to be useful. And so if you're not starting that and your competitors are, uh, you're already behind. Um, we are looking at a lot of things around sustainability, which I think is most more interesting here in Europe than it is in the States. But if you're not, if you don't care about the planet, you should be caring about all the millennials who care about sustainability, who are all the renters and all the, you know, kind of the, the new, the new consumers. Um, so we have companies like Sage Green Life, which is doing green walls on the indoors and outdoors, and um, other companies that are focused on on that as well. And then when I start thinking about so that, that's the here and now. When I start thinking about the future, you know, some of the things that get me excited about are you know, really how robotics is really making an impact. And so you know, people constantly talk about the package problem they have in the multifamily space. You know, I think that we're going to see robo-dogs that are helping to deliver the packages and drones that are you know, making a, a big difference. Um, we're going to see things like that helping the baby boomers in the senior community that's going to help with, um, it, with, with a big difference in the senior housing. Um, so I, and, and then, um, yeah, I think that there's just a lot of different trends that are kind of out in the future that, that is going to really change what we're doing today. We're going to see this convergence of live, work, and play, and how different companies are addressing that, I think, are really interesting. Great. Uh, we're, de we're definitely seeing just in New York uh, with uh, Lyric and uh, Airbnb and RxR. It's extraordinary. Roloff, um, so I, I know about, you know, what you, the firm's doing on the retail side, which I think is so friggin' cool uh, and innovative and unique. Um, 
What's, what's new that you're excited about? It could be the retail play or other, other things that Fifth Wall is focused on. Yeah, no, and I, I got to give a shout out to Lyric, which was my actually my first investment at Fifth Wall, and, and it was Pay great to see. Uh, <laughs> is, thanks for leading up to that. Um, so I'll, I'll put it in kind of three categories, and I think I totally agree with what Constance said, you know, echo what she said. There's the first category, which is kind of like, what is our landlords focused on? What are we helping them in particular fronts? Some of them may be investable on VC, may not. There's the middle stage of things that it's kind of, there's a few players, I'm not sure if incumbents are going to win in terms of the tech or new people, and then the end of like, you know, kind of moonshots. So the, the first group is, we're seeing huge demand for tenant engagement software. Um, so software at the building level, apps at the building level, uh, we're kicking off a ton of projects in that area for all of our LPs in Europe in specific. And I'm going to try to cater mine to Europe because I, it's a European audience. Um, so I think that that's the one thing that we're definitely seeing is, you know, apps for your apartment, apps for your office. Why is it that I can use my app for, I can use my phone for everything, but I can't use my phone to get into a building, right? So I think that you're going to see that in access control and applications, and, and that's from the LP level. So we're helping in RFPs in that front. Then there's kind of this middle area, which is, I think it's going to be really important for real estate innovation. So I think that it's going to be, it may even be a new asset class. Um, and I think that it's either going to be incumbents or maybe new players that come in. And, and the idea is really what's called ghost kitchens or cloud kitchens. Um, Anybody know what that is? I asked this question last week. Yeah. In Do people know, know what a ghost, ghost kitchen is? All right, so, so I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll explain. So basically, it's a commissary. So the idea is that if you're in London and you run a restaurant in North London, right, and you notice that your, first of all, food deliveries are going through the roof for most restaurants. So it's becoming almost more than half of revenue for most restaurants. But you notice that you have a lot of demand in East London, but you can't deliver to those people. What you'll do is traditionally you would say, okay, I need to build a restaurant in East London. Okay, I've got front of house, I've got all this cost. Well, what if you could just build a kitchen, right? And just do deliveries from that kitchen. And so there's a whole ecosystem of startups that are focusing on that. Now from a real estate perspective, why it's interesting for our LPs is that you can take you know, light industrial and in some case obsolescent retail and convert it into a cloud kitchen, right? Now, the reason that I think it's interesting from a startup perspective is that there's a lot of models. You could do a co-working model, like a co-kitchen model. You could run it for someone. But then I actually think that the people best played here, and, and this is going to hit SoftBank's portfolio in terms of what they do, is the delivery companies. Because they know what you're ordering, they know where you're ordering, they're set up that way. So I think that's going to be a big area. And then for the moonshots, quite frankly, you know, what we do is, is we look at a lot of the stuff that has worked in the US, and we say, where else could this work, right? Um, so you could see a lot of things in our portfolio and say, hey, could you do this in Europe, right? And I think that that's something I would look at as an entrepreneur. Now, some of the issues, you have some structural issues with certain things. So for instance, I'm not 100% clear that an open door would necessarily work in Europe because your residential commissions are a lot lower. Justin is staring at you. Because no. <laughs> your commissions are a lot lower here. So your, your brokerage fees are a lot lower here um, in, in the UK, for instance, than they are in the US. So you have less margin to go through. But I think that that's something we're looking at is those kind of moonshots in those areas um, that I think are going to be big. So. I like it. Justin. Can I say, hey, Roloff, so <laughs> you're talking about cloud kitchens and the yeah. dark kitchens. Um, I think this taps into, Michael, your first question on what are you looking for, Constance, you were talking about AI. You know, for, from my perspective, data is kind of the fuel for the engine rooms for all of these businesses, right? And so, um, you know, AI is a fancy way, you know, we talk a lot about it. I think a lot of companies still have a long ways to go, but how do you leverage that data most effectively in building those moats? Um, but just on your point on the cloud kitchens, that's exactly how we see it, right? It's, it's you know, we're investors in DoorDash and Alibaba Local Services, uh, recently invested in Rappi and Latin America. And we think there's a tremendous opportunity in this type of asset class, like finding those spaces where you can take kind of a light industrial footprint and put these kitchens but at the end of the day, you know, how do you know the best utilization of those assets? Um, it's not to say that DoorDash or Lapi or Alama have, have gone and done, made tremendous strides, but when they think about the opportunity, they're thinking about it from a data first perspective, which is to say, in this neighborhood of this city, I happen to know that we have a uh, a lot of Chinese food orders at between the hours of 6 and 9 p.m. that are underserved, we're not converting on those orders. And I also happen to know that across our portfolio, these are the types of dishes that 
consumers tend to prefer. These are the types of the imagery that consumers tend to prefer. All that information resides within these platforms. Uh, and, and I think that they're, they're the ones who are going to be best positioned to take advantage of these opportunities in the future because they have that consumer level transaction data. Right. I, I, there's going to be a huge yeah. push there, but how do you how do you find the right opportunities uh, or, or the right ways to play that? I, we almost always think about this from the data first perspective. We're getting cut off in a minute, but Dave, I just want to give you a <laughs> shot. Uh, what are you looking at now? What's what's interesting from JLL Sparks' perspective? Well, you know, I would really echo um, what uh, Roloff said about uh, the tenant experience app or whatever you want to call that category, right? Everyone is walking around with a smartphone in their pocket. Um, and whatever type of building you're in, whether it's your uh, apartment building in a multifamily complex or whether it's your office, uh, tenants are increasingly expecting, uh, you know, this control hub uh, that just plugs them into uh, whatever building it is, right? Uh, so uh, we made investments in uh, HQO, on the uh, office side, we invested in Lively on um, the multifamily side. Um, I do agree that there are some interesting tie-ins with access control as well, right? Uh, I think that um, you know the days of people carrying around these RFID cards are, are certainly numbered. Uh, and so that's something that uh, I'm kind of new to PropTech, but I gather that the whole tenant experience uh, concept is something that's been talked about for a long time. Now I see it actually happening. Um, yeah. Right. Can okay. I say yeah. One, one thing that I'm struck by here, this panel, it's fairly, it's it's fairly unusual on a VC panel to have all the VCs effectively have industry incumbents as LPs, advisors, as the you know basically sure. working um, you know hand in hand. This is an unusual panel for VC, and it's something that I think is much more common on the real estate side. And so so one observation is I, I do think that. There's a tremendous opportunity through through the funds and the individuals here to um, you know drive that innovation into organizations that doesn't exist in other areas. I'm just struck that there's not more that's happening organically, such that on this stage you have three of the four investors who are really like so deep in the industry to to, to be able to take these ideas and then incubate them and infuse them into the into the you know industry incumbents themselves. And I wonder what that means for, I, I know we're short on time, I think that would be an interesting uh, question I'd love to hear from the group. Um, but what does that mean for the industry? Right? What, what, what does that say about some of the incumbents today that you know, this is the way that um, you know, capital is getting raised, deployed, and that these relationships are getting built upon? It's a great, great final thought. We can talk about it at lunch, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Future Prop Tech. Thank you, Dave, Justin, Roloff, Kansas. Thank you much for, so much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Hope it was uh, informative. And, uh, and my partner, uh, Pierce Neinkin.